Hello again. Good evening for the last session on day three of the Congress. I'm really happy to see so many of you so late interested in such a particular topic um, that might be really, really relevant um, for many uh, in assessing our threat levels. So um, we will hear more about um, direct memory attacks and how they're still possible nowadays again. And Ulf Risk is here to show you and to tell you more about what you should know about it. Thank you. Tonight, we're going to talk about public FPDA-based direct memory access DMA attacking. My name is Ulf Frisk, and helping me with the demos today, I have Pieter Norin. I will start by briefly going through some background and previous work that's been done in the area. Then we'll jump straight into the actual DMA attacking. I will try to do a live demo in which we will transmit and receive PCI Express transaction layer packets. We will dump memory at speeds up to 75 megabytes per second. Then we'll have a look at the actual FPDA design that I created. After that, we will go into some more advanced DMA attacking. We will attack a vulnerable vanilla Linux system and a vulnerable UEFI. If you manage to get into UEFI, you might also be able to compromise secure boot, and then you can also compromise the not yet booted operating system, such as a Windows 10 system running virtualization-based security. And at the end, we will have a look at some future hardware that I'm really excited about. My name is Ulf Frisk. I'm employed in the financial sector in Stockholm, Sweden. I previously presented my work at the SECT conference in Stockholm and also at DEF CON in Las Vegas. I'm the author of the PCLH Direct Memory Access Attack Toolkit, and this has been a hobby project of mine since the start, and it still is. I also need to point out that I'm giving this talk as an individual. My employer is not involved in any way whatsoever. I'm here today to represent PCI Leach FPGA. PCI Leach FPGA is the combination between the Xilinx SP605 development board coupled with a FT601 USB3 add-on board. The PCI Express Generation 1 one-lane side goes into the target computer, or if you wish to call it the victim computer. The USB 3 side goes into the controller computer, or if you wish to call it the attacker computer. Once both sides are connected, the controller computer is able to send PCI Express transaction layer packets over USB onto the FPGA, which will then put them on PCI Express of the target system. We can also read PCI Express TLPs this way from the target system, and they will be forwarded onto the controller computer. The whole hardware setup as such is between five and $600 in total. And with it, you will be able to do DMA to both 32-bit memory address space below four gigs and 64-bit memory address space above four gigs. You will be able to do DMA at around 75 megabytes per second. Everything that I created is totally open source, but I'm using some vendor proprietary blobs in there, unfortunately. So that's why the title of today's talk is public and not open. If I compare the SP605 FPGA solution with the, the earlier hardware I used for DMA attacks, the USB 3380, the USB 3380 was sold out earlier this year, and uh, the uh, FPGA solution is a little bit more expensive. It's bulkier. It's also slower, as is at the moment. But it's much more stable, and you will be able to do 64-bit DMA memory addressing as well. And that means that you're able to access memory above four gigs as well as memory below four gigs. And this is a huge difference compared to the old hardware that we were only able to access memory below four gigs with. DMA attacks has been around since pretty much forever. I think you all heard of Inception, awesome FireWire DMA attacking tool. If you haven't used it or heard of it, please look it up. 
as a response to uh, the main attacks, as also as a response to the growing need for virtualization of devices, CPU vendors introduced the IOMMUs, or VTD, around 2008 and onwards. And if the IOMMUs are used properly, and by the firmware and the operating systems, they should be able to protect fully against DMA attacks. As we'll see today, that's not always the, that's not always the case. There's been lots of research in the, uh, in the uh, uh, DMA attacking space. I can't mention everyone here today. I thought I should mention uh, uh, the uh, Camino's work with his iron hide uh, from the academic area. Uh, that I used for his uh, PhD thesis, and also Snare and Racing did a really awesome Thunderbolt attacking, uh, DMA attacking talk back in 2014, actually using the exact same hardware that I'm using here today, the SP605. And then, uh, just a couple of months ago, Dimitri Oleksiuk released what I know to be the first DMA attack-focused FPGA bitstream into the public with his PCI Express do-it-yourself hacking toolkit. Dimitri also supported my work with the PCI Leech, and he also shared both, at first, binaries and some source code with me. And uh, it really pushed me to actually get the SP605 from the start and get going here. So really huge thanks to Dimitri. Without you, I wouldn't be here. Thank you. PCI Express is based on, uh, it's packet-based. The packets are called transaction layer packets, or TLPs. They are DWORD-based, 32-bit based. They usually consist of a header that are between three and four DWORDs long. And uh, the TLPs can have different types. For example, read memory, write memory, I.O., configuration messages, completions, and so on. Let's focus on the DNA TLPs here today, the memory read and write TLPs. The 64-bit write TLP is down on the left. It starts with uh, which type of packet it is in the first D word, and then you also have the length of the data that you wish to write in number of D words. The second D word contains the requester ID, which is the bus number and device number of the uh, actual device sending this P uh, TLP packet. And then since we are doing a 64-bit uh, write, that means that we're writing to 64-bit memory address space, we need to represent that address in two D words. And then we have the date at the end. When we do a write, we just post this message onto PCI Express, and we will trust that it will get written. We won't get any acknowledgement back that it was successful or not. When we are doing a read, it looks pretty much the same, the packets, except it's a different type, of course, since we are doing a read. Here we are doing a 32-bit memory read. And uh, once you submit that one, you need to wait a short while, and you will receive one or more completion TLPs back containing the actual data that you read. So let's do a demo. Let's transmit and receive PCI Express transaction layer packets. Let's enumerate the memory, and let's dump the memory. If we switch over the image to the hardware here, here I have the FPGA board. And I have a victim system here. So let's insert our Express card to uh, a PC Express adapter in the target computer and power on the FPGA. It's connected to my presenter computer via USB here. If we switch back to my presentation, uh, and here we have it from a slightly different angle, the hardware. Here we are trying to uh, uh, read something. We are going to read one D word from 64-bit memory address space. We are going to read from the address four gigs exactly this address here. See what happens. Here we send the read TLP, and we get a completion TLP back. And the completion TLP, the first three D words are uh, the header, and then we have the actual data that we read here. So let's uh, do a write as well. Let's uh, do a 64-bit memory write to the same address. Let's uh, do a 2D word long write to the very same address with uh, this data. 
and see if we can overwrite that previous data. So we send that TLP. And since we are doing a write, we won't get an answer back, no completions or anything like that. But we can uh, try to uh, read the memory back to see what happens if the write was successful. Let's try to read 30 D words this time from the very same address. Here we see that we get the completions back in two different completions. And if we check uh, in the beginning, we see that the previously read data is now overwritten with our new data here. We can also enumerate the memory of the target system. Since we don't know how much memory is in this computer, we need to check it out. And we can do this by reading a tiny portion of every page that we are able to read and uh, see how much memory there is in this computer. And physical memory address space in a modern day computer is not one big contiguous chunk of memory. You have uh, physical memory in there and you also have like holes in memory in which there are nothing. You have memory map PCI Express devices. You can have unreadable memory such as system management mode memory as well. Here we see that we read the that it seems to be failing after slightly more than 8 gigs here. So it's probably an 8 gig system. So let's try to dump the memory. Dumping memory takes a while, so let's go back to the presentation. These are all PCI Express form factors. You have the standard PCI Express card, as you all know, to the lower left. You have the mini PCI Express that goes pretty much behind the back covers of the laptops. You have the Express card that I use here today. Thunderbolt also carries PCI Express. Thunderbolt 3 is most often combined with the USB-C connector nowadays. And then you have the different M2 key form factors. For example, M2 key M is really common for NVMe drives. Here is the actual FPGA design that I created. It's rather simplistic. You have a block that uh, receives and transmits data over a 32-bit data connection from the USB, 33, uh, the USB uh, FT601 uh, hardware. And then you have the uh, uh, Xilinx PCI Express core on the other side that uh, handles the actual PCI Express communication. Everything in yellow here are Xilinx uh, IP blocks or IP cores, and they are not like uh, open source, so it's uh, vendor proprietary stuff. Uh, everything in green here is uh, stuff that I created though, so it's totally open source and it's found on my GitHub. We, re we receive some data from over the USB connector, L connection from the controller computer, and then we actually receive some data and some metadata because we know we need to know what kind of data we are receiving. If the data is a part of a transaction layer package, a TLP, we put it on the first out, first queue, uh, the FIFO queue for TLPs. If it's some other kind of data, for example, internal loopback debug data, we put it on an internal loopback FIFO, for example. If we do some, put the TLPs, uh, the data of the TLPs on the TLP FIFO, we transmit it to the Silings PC Express core, and that one will take care of everything practical. We receive data, we receive TLPs from uh, the Silings uh, PC Express core as well. And then, since we have different FIFOs here that we wish to read data from as well, we need some merge logic here. So, merge it into a stream that we can send back to the uh, controller computer. And actually, everything. Uh, like like formatting of the TLPs, it's actually done in software on the uh, controller computer. So this is a rather simplistic design, but it works. So let's uh, jump into some more advanced DMA attacking. Let's do a demo on a vulnerable vanilla Linux system. Let's locate and patch into the Linux kernel. And since uh, Linux kernel version 4.8, I believe. The uh, kernel is fully randomized in physical memory address space, which means that it's very likely that it will end up above the uh, 4 gig limit. And here, the FPGA hardware really shines compared to the older attack hardware that I used. So let's try to find the Linux kernel, patch into it. Let's mount the file system and unlock the computer. 
So here we have the Linux computer, and see that the memory dump was successful here. It's a little bit slower here today since I'm going through a USB hub, uh, unfortunately, but the memory dump seems to have worked. Uh, we switch to the uh, FPGA here, image. OK. Yeah. Uh, let's try to log on to this computer. Try to log on with the password of single A here. And it's the wrong password. We cannot get into that Linux computer. So if we switch back to the presentation, we can insert a kernel module into the running Linux kernel. We try to locate the Linux kernel. And uh, as we can see here today, it's actually found below 4 gigs. It's happened to be randomized in that position. So, uh, But it seems to be working anyway. Uh, let's mount the live file system using the kernel module address here. And once the file system is mounted, we can just click into it. Actually, we have mounted the live uh, memory, the uh, live RAM as well. Let we can go into the etc folder and locate the shadow file, which contains the password hashes of the users. We can just edit it in our favorite favorite editor here. And here we have uh, lots of user accounts with uh, no has hashes. And we have the user account at the very end. This has a very long password hash here. And of course, if you know the password hash, you can try to crack it or something like that. But that's no fun. It's much easier to just delete it and replace it with something else. And then we hit Save. Let's see if we can log on. If we switch back to uh, the uh, FPDA, try the single password of A. Thank you. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. If we go through the other computer here, uh, we need to, uh, if we can switch the camera to the other computer. Yeah, this was like filming already. Um, we can also attack uh, UEFI. Um, UEFI, some UEFIs may protect themselves against DMA attacks. Most UEFIs don't. Uh, if you are able to get into UEFI, you might even compromise secure boot. Uh, let's uh, try to get into UEFI here today. Let's backdoor the exit boot services function that is called by the uh, operating system loader uh, once it wish to take control of the target system. Let's uh, retrieve the memory map of uh, the EFI memory map, and let's also patch the not yet booted Windows kernel that is loaded at this stage. And actually, what I'm doing here today, Dimitri has done some really awesome work in this area as well. So if you haven't checked out his stuff, I really would like you to do that. Uh, so if we switch to the, oh, maybe we can have this here. Uh, so here we have another system. We need to switch around the FPGA here, I think. Cabling. So what we are doing, we are inserting the FPGA here in the not yet booted computer. And uh, if we start it, we switch back to the presentation. Fail to connect to the device. Let's try to do it again. Yeah, it works better this time. Probably a bad connection. The computer is starting. 
And uh, now the operating system loader called into the exit boot services function, which we hooked with our code. We uh, trapped it there. We retrieved the UEFI memory map or the EFI memory map here. And uh, once we are in this stage, the Windows kernel is already in the memory. The normal Anthos kernel, the hypervisor is already in the memory, and the secure kernel is already in the memory. But the Windows operating system is not yet booted, so it cannot protect itself against EMA attacks yet. So here we can actually patch into the uh, Linux the Windows kernel. And uh, if you look at Windows virtualization-based security, it uh, has something that can, we can enable that protects uh, kernel code integrity with the help of the hypervisor and secure kernel. With regards to evil devices that are trying to do DMA access to the memory, the uh, hypervisor and the secure kernel memory, uh, we have no access to that memory at all. Normal executable pages in the normal uh, Windows space uh, normal user space, normal kernel space are marked as read only with regards to DMA from evil devices, so we cannot patch the memory directly there. And normal non executable pages are pretty much as usual read write. And uh, as I said, the uh, kernel mode code integrity features are not yet enabled in this stage. We are now, since the Windows operating system is not yet booted. So let's uh, try to insert some code there and uh, spawn a system shell. Here we located, we communicated with our UEFI module, we located the Windows kernel, and uh, we located some code caves in there to put our code in there. And uh, now Windows is booting, enabling virtualization-based security. We cannot edit the kernel anymore, but our evil code is already in there. So we should be able to try to log on to this computer if we switch to the FPGA. Here we have the uh, Windows computer. I try to log on to that one using no password at all. And as you can see, we couldn't log on. If we switch back to the presentation, let's uh, change that. Let's uh, spawn a system shell. Here we are, system. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, if we are system, we can uh, remove the password of the user account. And if we switch back to the FPGA, we can try to log on. And we're in. <laughs> if we switch back to the presentation, we can also dump the memory of the Windows system. Here we see that we get lots of failed pages when we are dumping the memory. It's pages that are marked as uh, not readable via the IOMMU, via VTD, that Windows protects. It's primarily the hypervisor and secure kernel pages in memory. We cannot read those, but everything else pretty much we can. PCLH FPGA is uh, open source pretty much, uh, at least the parts I uh, coded. It's uh, found on uh, GitHub, and uh, I try to make it as easy to use as possible. You don't need any prior FPGA knowledge at all. You should just be able to flash it on this hardware and start uh, DMA attacking. Unfortunately, it's Windows only at the moment on the attacker PC. I have some Linux uh, uh, driver problems with the hardware I'm using here. I hope to resolve that quite soon. And what's even more exciting is that there seems to be coming lots of devices quite soon to be able to do DMA attacks. For example, there will be lots of, yeah, uh, some devices will be really inexpensive, while some others will um, be a little bit more pricey, but still less pricey than the SP605 solution. One such example is a new hardware, the PC Express Screamer. It's a new hardware by Key2, Ram Tina Amin. It's going to be easier to use. It's going to be a lower price tag than the SP605 solution. It's going to be more capable, PC Express Generation 2. 
and uh, I plan to add support for this one sometime early 2018 here. So it's going to be really, really early next year, hopefully in the coming month. To sum everything up, affordable FPGA DMA attacking is the reality of today. Physical access is still an issue. IMMUs are there in the hardware since forever, but they might not always be used. And I hope I've shown you today that I believe there is more research to be done in this area, and hopefully my tools will be useful to everyone that is interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ulf. So everybody just saw that you should keep your devices always on the person. And we have questions. Microphone one, please. So one question I have is, right now you're dumping memory and uh, doing edits in memory and uh, patching the kernel. Uh, did you have the idea of, uh, say, taking the uh, writing and driver for, say, a virtual machine, which is mapping another machine's memory into that virtual machine so that you can kind of, say, stop the processor and the attack machine, ha use a virtual processor to do operations on the memory of the uh, victim machine, uh, where you can see what the program is doing in your emulator. Uh, I haven't gone into like uh, attacking with like the virtual machines and nasty stuff as well, but it's an interesting idea uh, to be able to go into. If I, I, I do have kernel access at the moment, so it should be possible. Uh, but this is uh, like a hobby project of mine. My time is a little bit limited here. Uh, it would be this stuff is out there, so it would be awesome if uh, someone could actually look into this. I think it might be quite useful. So we have a lot of questions here also from the Signal Angel. It's actually not that many, just two. Uh, what prevents you from implementing the PCIe device without any proprietary stuff? And is the controller limited to Windows because of that proprietary stuff? Uh, to ask the uh, Windows question, it's, uh, I believe I get it working on uh, Linux quite soon. Um, it's just a driver issue. I just haven't had the time to actual, actually code it for Linux yet. Uh, I had a little bit of a problem with that driver, but it shouldn't be any problem, really. I just need to find the time to actually do it. And uh, uh, the other question I, with regards to I use the, I'm quite new to FPGAs, actually, so I just use the uh, default uh, tools that uh, the Xilinx toolkit provides. Uh, it should be possible to replace some elements with uh, more open elements in this design as well. But I'm uh, really FPGA noob here, so it's, uh, this was my first attempt at an FPGA, so it should be possible to do this as well. So you should talk to each other further. <laughs> so, um, so microphone two, please. Uh, so I wonder if you uh, can access uh, the memory used by Intel ME the EMA, which is not accessible by the main CPU. No, this is uh, out of limits from this. It's going to be mapped away in the PHA platform controller hub. So it's, uh, I shouldn't be able to access, this, access it. And I cannot access uh, system management mode memory either. OK, thank you. And the last question from microphone three. Um, you're using ThinkPads, as I've seen. Do any BIOS settings of those ThinkPads interfere with your DMA attack? For example, does disabling the express card slot really help? Or is that just more disabling just the power lines or something? Uh, disabling the express card slot will help. Then I can't get into the express card slot. But usually on laptops, if you unscrew the back cover, there are something like a Wi-Fi card or something like that in there. That's probably going to be PC Express as well. And that's maybe it's harder to disable that one. Um, if I may, the question before the last one, I can answer that. You can't replace some of the Xilinx cores, for example, the PCI Express one, because that's so-called hard IP, yeah. that's really on FPGA, non-changeable stuff. Um, so it's just 
yeah, yep. hardware. It's hardware and uh, yeah, but you the should FIFOs, be the FIFO you should be able yeah. probably. Thank you. Thank you. On microphone two, uh, did you wanted to say something still? Okay, no. So thanks again. Thank you, Ulf Fusk. And ah, somebody showed up from microphone one. Yeah. So. I'm on? Yeah. So uh, regarding the hard IP, so what these hard IPs normally implement is uh, the uh, physical interface to the PCI Express, which is doing these transaction layer packets. But uh, the actual DMA is usually done uh, using an IP core, which you load into the thing. So usually it's the DMI IP core, which is proprietary and running on the hard IP for the PCI uh, physical layer. So you would probably need an open DMR AIP core. OK. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so now we're done with all the questions. I guess uh, you will have a lot of people surrounding you um, after the talk uh, to not speak into microphones. And yeah, I wish you a great evening. And thanks again, Ulf Frisk. <laughs>